for the three Sundays Gail and I are about to be on vacation. Not next Sunday. I will be with you next Sunday. <clears throat> but uh, three weeks following, April, that's April 29, and the first two weeks in May, uh, we have Dr. Hank Knight coming to teach you. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Knight may seem sort of a strange mix in that he was strong safety on Bear Bryant's Alabama football team that were nat- was, was a national championship team, but he was an English major. And uh, after graduating from the University of Alabama with a degree in English, uh, went on to Vanderbilt and received his Master of Divinity and then his Doctor of Ministry degree uh, from Vanderbilt. <clears throat> Decided that God was calling him to be a uh, campus minister, dean of chapel in colleges, and came to Tulsa uh, 15 years ago and was dean of the chapel at University of Tulsa for 14 years. Last year he became uh, director of Holocaust education, working through the museum, the Sherwin Miller Museum here, uh, and has a big program coming up uh, a week from this coming Thursday, the annual remembrance of the Shoah or the Holocaust. Uh, Dr. Hank Knight is truly amazing in his knowledge about the Holocaust. I've told you that when he decided that this is the direction his ministry should go, of helping Christians deal with our scriptures in a way that does not lead to violence or discrimination of any kind against Jews, that he went to Auschwitz and purposely took a hotel room uh, in a small little hotel, very old, that's right beside the railroad tracks. And that all night long, the trains ran uh, with those same screaming little whistles that they had on them in 1944, 1945. And of course, uh, the Germans, the Nazis, built the camp at Auschwitz because it's where more railroads of Europe came together than any other single place. It's sort of strange in if you think about uh, <clears throat> right up the road here uh, in Oklahoma, we have more great pipelines come together, uh, you know, at Drumright than than any other place uh, in this part of the part of the country. They come together at Drumright, Oklahoma. Well, in that situation, it was a small Polish town where more railroads, I mean, from Paris and and Berlin and Rome and all these, they came together right there. Anyway, Dr. Knight said he he felt he needed to experience those trains. And he'd been reading, reading, reading all this material about the Holocaust and and books written by Holocaust survivors. And he said he didn't think it would be ten minutes until another train would come screaming through. And and this little hotel where he was staying was so close that it would shake when the trains went by. It would shake. And he said he went through three or four nights of that, you know, of appearing that I can tell you that when Gail and I went there just to, to spend uh, five hours in Auschwitz and try to choke down a, a little bit of sandwich and soup and go right on to Beer Canal and spend another four or five hours after we had already been at Madonic two days before and so on is is, uh, is an experience one will never forget. So anyway, Dr. Hank Knight is going to teach you three Sundays on how Christians deal with our scriptures in a way that does not lead to discrimination against, certainly not violence against, God's chosen people. The ones he first selected to teach the world that there's only one true God and how this God relates to us, we relate to him, and we relate to each other. Um, I can assure you, you're in for a real treat. So, uh, if you have friends, a family, anyone who would like to have this kind of information, invite them to come with you. April 29 and the first two Sundays in May, he will be with you. And then I will be back with you on May 20, and we'll pick right up again with the Gospel of John. But I, I thought he would be, uh, last year, remember, he had Amy and Bill Kroll uh, deal with uh, the Da Vinci Code. And many of you seem to enjoy that change of pace, and I think Enjoy is not the right word for the material that Dr. Knight will be teaching you, but but interesting, uh, uh, informative. Uh, he has worked so faithfully and well in this field 
that when Dr. A. Lee Wiesel came to speak at the University of Tulsa, he walked you know, across the room and said, Hi, Hank, how are you? Uh, when Dr. Uh, Rabbi Greenberg was here just a month ago and Gail and I went out to hear him, uh, you know, he walks across the room and says, Hey, Hank, how are you? That's how well known he is in this field of Holocaust education. And you have him for free for three Sunday mornings, so I hope you'll be here. All right, let's pray before we get underway. God, this book of yours is the most important in the world to us because it's about you. It's about us. It's about how you initiate relationship with us. And if we respond to that initiation from you, we can be rightly related to you. And then you will teach us how to be rightly related to each other. So this book is the book for us. Help us uh, read Mark, underline, commit to memory those things that we need uh, to help us live the everyday of our lives, both individually and collectively as the Boston Avenue United Methodist Church. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, our scholar we're using for this particular book is Dr. Gerard Sloyan. Uh, Dr. Sloyan, I told you, is uh, head of New Testament studies at Temple University in Philadelphia, um, and uh, I have a number of commentaries on John's Gospel, uh, one written by Dr. Raymond Brown, uh, whose whole adult lifetime was this community that surrounded John. It produced uh, the Gospel of John. It produced three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It produced the Revelation as well. That community, even if they are not all written by exactly the same person, we'll get to the, more about that later, um, but... Dr. Raymond Brown's commentary is 1,400 pages. You and I can't deal with 1,400 pages and get to Revelation before we die. So we're going to deal with Gerard Sloyan. Uh, when I'm writing a sermon on John, I certainly read the parts from Raymond Brown and others. But I thought for our use here, Dr. Sloyan goes into enough detail, but not so much that we can't get on to the book of Acts sometime in the future. So we're going to deal with this. As we go through, we're going to be seeing that, that these three that we've already dealt with now are called, just almost universally now, the synoptics. And this little prefix here, S-Y-N, we have on our word synonym. And this nomos is to name something. So a synonym are words that, that look alike. Okay? They look alike. In this case, there are three Gospels that look alike. Now, we've spent a good bit of time pointing out how they differ. Uh, they're not the same. Matthew uh, has in front of him Mark. Luke has in front of him Mark. They also have in front of them the Greek rendering of the Hebrew Scriptures called the Septuagint. They also have, Matthew and Luke, the, the quella, the source of the teaching materials that they use liberally, uh, these two, uh, particularly the parables and so on. So they're not identical, but they certainly look more alike because basically Matthew and Luke follow the outline of Mark. They differ with him from time to time, but basically sort of follow the outline of Mark's gospel. So they're called synoptics. John's gospel is entirely different from the other three. Uh, I don't mean contradictory so much as it just deals with the gospel in an entirely different way. And that's what we're about here. So uh, we've prayed, and we still aren't quite through the introduction of Dr. Sloyan that I think you and I both need to hear, um, and, and then we'll get right on into the reading. Again, what I try to do is go through and read the commentary. I highlight parts that I think sum up uh, the, the most cogent points, and we don't read all the rest of it. So on some pages we may have two or three sentences, and on others we may have a couple of paragraphs. The fourth gospel, John seems to have been edited thoroughly by the hand that appended the last chapter, 21. Let me just stop a second and say, we haven't come to chapter 21 yet, but we will, of course. And when we do, Dr. Sloyan and others will build the case that they believe the original writer of John ended at chapter 20. Uh, that, that the first writer ended at chapter 20. In chapter 20, he says, um, I haven't told you everything that I could have told you, but I told you this much in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in his name. Well, end of story. And then in chapter 21, 
we have another resurrection story. And so a number of scholars, Dr. Sloyan among them, believes that whoever put chapter 21 on there also went through the first 20 chapters and edited them a little bit, made slight variations and changes. So I simply pointed out now in the introduction, and as we go through, I'll show you what, where he thinks uh, a later editor has changed the gospel a little bit, that he thinks it's not quite in keeping with the original author. Uh, those are the kind of things that, that we deal with in, in this class, and I'll try to help you. The immediately previous version can be reconstructed with some confidence by distinguishing between what bears the mark of an editor's hand and what does not. And all he means by that is, he's already told you, he thinks somebody else wrote chapter 21, and he thinks that same person went through the first 20 chapters, but he thinks he can do an adequate job of pointing out where those little editions uh, come, where someone has tampered a little bit with the text, if you would. So, let's go on. There was a Christian genius, he calls him, of the Hellenist Jewish tradition who used the Septuagint Bible but was not unfamiliar with the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible who decided to emulate the literary form tradition gospel which was already in place. Okay, let me go and help you here because that's a mouthful. When he says... Hellenistic, what does that mean? Greek, absolutely. It means Greek, but he added to it Hellenistic Jewish. And what he means by that is Jews who were living in a dominated Mediterranean world, dominated by Greeks. Now, we know the Romans are in control, of course, by the time Jesus comes along. But many of them have not been as influenced yet by the Roman way of doing things as they were by the Greek way of doing things, because Alexander the Great had preceded Jesus by 400 years. And so that 400-year period, they are more Greek than they are Roman at this point. But underneath it all, they are Jews. And Dr. Sloyan believes that this is such a community of Jews originally, of Jews. John, all the first disciples, of course, were Jews, and that a community had grown up around them, but in a predominantly Hellenistic world. And so this gospel is going to be affected much by that Hellenistic world and the Hellenistic way of expressing things. So he thinks quite consciously, he calls him a genius, this genius, he said, well, this way of telling the story has been done three times. So I'm going to tell this differently in order to speak into this kind of world. Paul himself uh, was one of those Hellenistic Jews, if you would. He was born in Tarsus, which by now was a Roman province, thereby making him a Roman citizen. Same way that illegals can come across the Rio Grande River down in Texas. And if they have a baby on this side of the river, that baby is a U.S. citizen, whether it's mother and daddy are or not. That baby is a U.S. citizen having been born here. So Paul, being born in Tarsus, was a Roman citizen. But Tarsus was primarily a Greek-thinking city. Okay. The Romans controlled it, but the Greeks had been there, and their culture, their way of thinking, had dominated for about 400 years. So that's what he means, Hellenistic Jewish. Okay, don't want these phrases to, to scare you here. So let me drop that part out of the sentence now and says, he uses the Septuagint. And remember Septuagint, do I need to write that again? uh, This is just a word that refers to the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And here he used another word you may not be familiar with, and that's Masoretic. And what he means by that is that's the oldest manuscript we have of the Hebrew scriptures. We actually have older Septuagints than we have Masoretic texts. But we do have Masoretic, meaning Hebrew. Uh, It's the Hebrew text. So he's saying he, this writer, this genius, he calls him. Obviously, a man doesn't spend his adult lifetime dealing with John if he doesn't believe in John. So the genius, he says, who produced this gospel um, has in front of him the Septuagint, and he can he will point out places where he feels he's drawing straight out of the of the Greek rendering, not varying even a word. But there are other times when he shows that he's translating, if you would, 
uh, from Hebrew. It's not exactly this. So he thinks he has the Masoretic text in front of him as well. Or at least he's familiar with the Masoretic text. Okay. Then let me drop those little phrases out of the sentence and see. There was a Christian genius of this community using the Septuagint, familiar with the Masoretic text, who decided to emulate the literary form tradition gospel which was already in place. So he's aware of these others. He's going to write a gospel, but it's going to be very different. He must have been convinced that extent exemplars, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of the gospel genre known to him were inadequate to his community. They needed to hear it told a different way. He proposes teachings of Jesus, incidents in his life, parabolic material, simply meaning parables, theological reflections, and that means simply reflecting on who God is, and a trial passion, that's the, the last week is what he means, account which much resembles Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but never in quite the same form. Did he know any one of these synoptic gospels at first hand? An occasional scholar of quality, like C.K. Barrett, one of the great English-Scottish scholars, I, I love Dr. Barrett's commentary, um, an occasional scholar of quality like C.K. Barrett thinks he had the Mark and Gospel in front of him and tries to point out why he thinks so. Uh, support for his possession of certain Lucan writings of Luke developed narratives is quite strong, especially in the Passion narratives, that is, the last week of Jesus' life. John sets himself to do something quite like the synoptics about Jesus, but in an all but unique fashion. Okay. So, what has he said? He said, did he have knowledge of the others? Well, some really good scholars like C.K. Barrett said, they think he does know about Mark's gospel. And some others, he said, think, well, he does show some kinship to Luke as well. He's not using word by word by word the way these do of each other but he seems to have some knowledge about them. That's all he said. So, uh, the editing by this person who wrote chapter 21, if he's right about that, the editing was largely sympathetic. I mean, this person obviously admired the work of John and done from a standpoint similar to that of the author. He's not trying to destroy. He thinks it needs a little enhancing. He's going to make it a little bit better. Uppermost was the intention to memorialize Jesus, the founder of the Christian movement. The traditional witnesses, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, appear in John's gospel, but surprisingly, the sons of Zebedee, James, and John, who are so important in the synoptics, are never mentioned by John. Isn't that interesting? Rivaling Peter in stature is the anonymous disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, now we will see this phrase. This person is never called by name. He's never called by name. But the gospel is called the gospel according to St. John. And so, scholars believe this is he. Not John himself, not that John of the original twelve, but someone who loved him very much. Who loved and admired this old disciple of Jesus so much that he couldn't imagine that Jesus wouldn't have loved him best of all. And so, where these put Peter, Andrew, James, and John on pretty much an equal standing, Peter is... He's the out front bold one, of course, but he's also the one out front in denying Jesus. But Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John, are very important here. Here, the rivalry in this author's mind is between Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, who seems to be John. So even when he gets to the to the resurrection appearance, he will say, Peter and John ran to the tomb. John got there first. Remember? John's very important to him, obviously. And so the disciple whom Jesus loved is probably this author's great love for his mentor. And he cannot imagine that Jesus wouldn't have loved him better than all the rest, or at least as much as. Okay, 
There is the master idea that Jesus is the true teacher sent by God from heaven, his proper home, to a human world below. Now think about it. He's just told you he's writing to Hellenistic thinking folks. Now if you're a Hellenist, then your idea of the universe is that of Plato. And Plato talks about different levels of the earth. Uh, and creation, if you would, though he doesn't use the word creation. These are the philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, who will talk about God as the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause. They believe that on this plane where we live, uh, one has imperfection. The plane below us is where people go when they die. It's damp and dark like tombs. And up above us is a perfected world. So uh, you may have a favorite chair at your house, but it's not a perfect chair. It's a little far off the floor for your wife or a little close to the floor for your husband. It's a little too soft for one. It's a little too hard for another. The armrests are too far apart for one. They're too close together for another. It may be a very fine chair, but it's not a perfect chair because only up there is perfection. In that third strata, one has a perfected chair, and we're trying generation after generation to come as close to making the perfect chair as we can. Right? We'll get to more of that later. But that's what he means when he says he's writing into this Hellenistic world. So Jesus has come from the perfected world to the world where we live of imperfection. He's come below, and this world is dominated by darkness, and John equates darkness with sin. People love darkness better than light because their deeds were evil, he will say in chapter 3. He was the true light coming into the world, and the darkness has never been able to put it out, and so on. So the world below is characterized by darkness, and the world above for him is characterized by light. And light has come from the world above into the world below. He will even descend to that third level when he really is dead, before he is raised all the way to level three again. That's a, that's a Hellenistic way of, of envisioning. But it's stuck with us, has it not? Even though today we know that up and down and around don't mean what they used to, we still use that terminology. That's all he's trying to say. Okay, let's get back here. Let's go on. He is a revealer of the reality of God who has no previous rival in his intimacy with God Almighty. Not Abraham, according to John, not Moses, not any of the prophets. John's favored term to describe God is the Father, just as he inclines toward the Son for Jesus. So, Jesus uses a word that's used in everyday parlance among Jews of Abba, Abba. But it is not an expression used before Jesus' time generally to talk to God or about God. John says this is very important. That Jesus was the Son and God was the Father and that relationship uh, was extra special once in all of history. Jesus is fully and indisputably human for John. But he is also a person in a closer relationship to the Father than anyone has ever been to the God of creation. Jesus, in this gospel, comes from Nazareth in Galilee and is Joseph's son. He and his mother are invited guests at a wedding in Cana, a nearby village. We have visited Cana before. Yet there is a sense in which Jesus' proper homeland is Judea. That's in the south around Jerusalem. It can be argued from the way John uses the proverb about no prophets being esteemed in his own country that he means Judea, the south. The Judean crowds are almost consistently opposed to Jesus in this gospel. No other gospel is so harsh on the Jews. Uh, John's gospel has been one of the most 
divisive forces ever in uh, separating Jews from Christians. And we'll have to deal with all that when we get to it. What John meant by that. Jesus is a sign of division throughout this gospel. Faced with Jesus, people either come to believe in him and thereby walk in the light, or they choose the darkness of non-belief and can expect judgment, condemnation. Its colors, John's gospel, are primary. Means no pastels, no shadings. It's black and white. It's red, green, blue, or yellow. And not 500 colors. The author is totally self-confident. He's given you the truth, and there is no quibbling about it. John's gospel is a sharp weapon that can be grasped by handle or blade. I thought that was an interesting sentence. John's gospel is a sharp weapon that can be grasped by the handle or by the blade, and every paragraph is an invitation to do the one or the other. Think about that imagery. Hold on to it the next uh, couple of months. The gospel seems to be the document of a community of dissident diaspora Jews. Okay, let's think about that again. We know that John's gospel was the last of the four written. Uh, It was written probably after 90. We'll get to his exact date here. But most scholars say probably... 90 to 100, maybe even 105, but usually 90 to 100 of that first century. So what do we know has happened in the year 70? Destruction of Jerusalem, destruction of the temple. So 20 to 25, maybe 30 years before, the Romans had wiped Jerusalem off the map. I mean, they've burned it, they've tumbled stones to the ground. That famous wailing wall we talk about where the Jews gather to offer prayers and stick them into the crevices between the rocks, that's all that was left of the Temple Mount when the Romans got through with it. Everything from those huge stones right at the bottom up have all been redone after the Roman destruction of the city. And the Romans thought they had to do it because the Jews were not easy to govern. And they rebelled and rebelled and uh, you know, they'd kill 10 Romans here, they'd kill 15 Romans there. You know, they had their little curved blades and, and they were killing. And the Romans finally said, that's it. And they came in and destroyed the city. But it's happened, definitely happened uh, long before John writes. So both Christians and Jews dispersed. So that's called the diaspora, the diaspora. And he believes that this gospel is produced by a community of Jews living now in a Hellenistic or Greek world. It's a Roman world by government, remember. I know that. I don't mean that I've forgotten that. It is a Roman-dominated world, but the thought patterns have been set in motion for 400 years by Greeks. Okay. Everybody clear about that? All right. Uh, The one who speaks for this community is John. John. It is not in the first instance interested in telling the story of Jesus' career, just one, two, three, what happened next. Rather, this author wishes to proclaim Jesus' identity to contemporaries, that is, people living in the year 90 to 100. It is to engage them in the story that everything is told. It is to engage them. John, like any good storyteller, uses his characters to say what he wants to say about the significance of his believing community by telling of the significance of Jesus. John does not produce a work of fiction. His narrative is definitely historically based, but its primary goal is persuasion. In the interest of persuading the hearer, he will use every technique known to the narrator's art. Okay? When we speak of John the author who gave us the gospel we have in hand, we refer to someone continually choosing what he means to tell us and how to tell us. The narrator is the one who speaks in the prologue, and we're going to get to that in just a moment, who tells the story, introduces the dialogue, provides explanations, translates terms, and tells us what various characters knew or did not know. In short, the narrator tells us what to think. The church has declared this gospel canonical in the canon. Okay, It's measured up. It ought to be in holy writ and inspired by God. 
John, as narrator of this story, makes explanatory comments throughout his gospel. These interjected footnotes have been listed as being maybe as few as 60, and some scholars think as many as 120 times when he explains some little word, phrase, or why they do that next. So he's writing to people who don't know a lot of the things that would have been known at the time Jesus lived. These footnotes are an essential part of the text. And I don't mean literally he put them down at the bottom of the page as we do footnotes. Simply he interspersed them within the text itself. And I'll point these out as we go along. This makes the reader of 90 to 100 and the reader of 2007 better informed than any character in the story. We know more than the people he's writing about know. John usually speaks in the third person. He's telling, but occasionally he lapses into we, what we did next and what we experienced. Does this mean that we have no assurance in this gospel that the events and words conveyed to us really happened as described? They happened, to be sure. But as described, namely in John's narrative world, that is the truth of this gospel as it is of the other three. It gives us the significance or meaning of Jesus Christ as one author and his community who perceived it. The fourth gospel gives us no raw data in the historical order of Jesus of Nazareth. All the data are processed. Now let me stop and tell you what he means by that. When we get over to chapters 14, 15 of John, John has these long passages, whole chapters, when no one is around but Jesus. Jesus is talking to God. So where did John get those speeches? There were no tape recorders. There were no cameras. There was no stenographer there listening while Jesus prayed to God. So where did he get them? John, I think, Dr. Sloyan thinks, and Dr. Raymond Brown and all these others, Dr. C.K. Barrett, all these scholars believe that John is taking very seriously what he tells you in chapters 14 and 15. I am going soon. I will pray to the Father. So he calls him Abba again. I will pray to the Father, and he will send you the paraclete. Translated in King James's comforter. In your translation there on the back of the pew is counselor. Sometimes translated advocate. We know he means the Holy Spirit. The Muslims think he means Muhammad the prophet. No, it means the Holy Spirit as far as we're concerned. The Holy Spirit will come and remind you of everything and teach you. The Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I've said and teach you. And they, the scholars, take that to mean that John believes if the Holy Spirit's telling him something, it's the same as Jesus telling him. Well, an important part of that long discourse is also, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Did the historical flesh and blood Jesus say that? Or did the Holy Spirit say that to John 60, 70 years later? We'll get to that. Stick around. We'll get to all those passages in time. But what Dr. Sloyan is trying to say to you is, is this gospel based on historical fact, things that really happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. But John is also telling this story as he believes the Holy Spirit of God is helping him tell the story. All right. Now, we're about to get into it, so get your Bibles ready. The four Gospels do not begin in the same way, as you know. Mark's Gospel begins with what? Recall? The shortest, oldest of the four Gospels begins with the baptism And calling disciples. Mark has absolutely nothing about Jesus' birth and nothing about his childhood. Uh, Matthew begins how? Begins with the genealogy. 
This genealogy goes all the way back to the beginning of time uh, as they understood it and to, to, to their holy writ and is trying to say Jesus is of the lineage of David. Matthew will go to great lengths to convince that Jesus was like Moses but greater than Moses. Because the Jews to this day believe the clearest revealer of God not in, not in his flesh, but in his teachings and actions, was Moses. But Moses was the clearest revealer of God. It was Moses that received the new name from God, the Eye Asher Eye. It was Moses who received from God the Ten Commandments. It was Moses who was enabled by God through plague upon plague to free the people from Egyptian rule after 400 years of being enslaved. Moses is the key. Matthew's goal to convince people that Jesus is like Moses, but greater than Moses. And if Moses made his biggest uh, accomplishment, if you would, in facing down Pharaoh, what kind of people come to see the baby Jesus? Magi. And they bring gold and frankincense. Myrrh. And Luke says, you know why Jesus came? God sent Jesus because of the marginalized, the voiceless, the powerless. On the night Jesus was born, there was a heavenly chorus who sang to shepherds. Shepherds. And poor shepherds were the first ones to come and see the baby Jesus. And Matthew will say, blessed are the poor in spirit. And Luke will say, blessed are the poor. Poor. Well, John's gospel doesn't start with any of those. John's gospel starts with a prologue. And there's no doubt that it's Reminiscent of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was darkness. There was chaos. God spoke and there was light. And there was order and so on. John begins, In the beginning was the Word. Now, the word for word in Greek is logos, L-O-G-O-S. We would write it in English uh, alphabet, L-O-G-O-S. In the beginning was the logos. The logos was with God. Now, here again, John is writing into a Hellenistic world. And the Jews held up this logos as being, you know, if we could just find that word in Greek, it looks like this. If we could just find that word that comes from the upper universe, if you would, then we would know beauty, truth, love, the things that really matter. They're bound up in the Logos. If we could just find the word. I've told you about Dr. Viktor Frankl, a Jewish psychiatrist, Vienna, Austria. He and his family, captured by the Nazis, put first into ghetto, then transported into concentration camp. He was at Auschwitz. Uh, managed to survive. Uh, was physically strong enough to keep working. I heard him speak at SMU in Dallas years ago. He was about this tall, weighed 125 pounds probably. So he wasn't Charles Atlas or anything, but he must have had a lot of spunk, a lot of drive. He made it through. And when he got back to his practice of psychiatry, he wrote, Man's Search for Meaning. That was his book. He wrote others later. That was the big seller, Man's Search for Meaning. And his statement in the book is, I discovered a man could endure almost any how if he had a sufficient why. 
and he called it the search for the Logos, the biggest why of your life. So, though he did, he was not Christian. He was a Jew all of his life. But he believed the Greeks were onto something here. We're all searching for that word, which is beauty, truth, meaning, purpose, and so on. Well, John understands that. He's writing into this kind of world. And so he says, in the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was with God. The Logos was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Logos was made flesh and dwelt among us. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But to those who received him, who believed on his name, he gave the power to become children of God. That's a very different beginning from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? Let's read. Open your Bibles and let's read. You'll see what I've just been saying to you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. Not through John, through the light. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John, now he means the baptizer, testified to him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The Torah indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Isn't that a different beginning? It is. Let's see what Dr. Sloyan says about all that. Okay? The activity of John the prophet, baptizer, is placed in relation to this one coming. A man in time, John, witnesses to a heavenly word and light, which likewise has now become a man in human time. The story features a figure in the desert who wishes to downplay his own importance and testify to what is true about the Son of God. In actual history, the memory of the prophet John was probably still strong in Palestine and farther east at the time this gospel was written. John remained popular long after he was beheaded by Herod Antipas. His technique, this writer, is to make the Baptist a witness to Jesus, that and nothing more. John's testimony is that Jesus is the sacrificial Lamb of God. Now, John is the one who really hones in on this Lamb of God thing. Okay, The Lamb of God, the Lamb at the Passover, if you have faith in me, kill a, an unblemished Lamb, spotless, without blemish of any kind, Take a little bit of blood and mark a cross on your doorpost, an X, and the angel of death will pass over tonight when Egyptian babies are going to be killed. Um, That sacrificial lamb, no blemish, no spot. John will make a big deal of the fact that the others crucified with Jesus will have their legs broken. His legs, they do not break, he said. He is the sacrificial lamb. 
whose blood cleanses, frees, gets us out of the Egypt of sin and death. We'll get to all that later. Okay, John's testimony is that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of God who will take away the world's burden of sin. The evangelists, remember, they're all called evangelists by the early church. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the evangelists, those telling, those sharing the message. The evangelist here, John, is sure of this and has no problem in making John the baptizer say it. It is primarily a tale about John the prophet and Jesus. Better, Jesus is illumined by the reflected glory uh, of John. John is receiving witness from the Holy Spirit, which he believes is coming straight to him from the resurrected Christ, and he's writing it down. The purpose was to come to his own home place and his own people, that is Jesus, those prepared for such an event by centuries of God's loving self-disclosure, that they might receive him, believe in him, and thereby be empowered to become offspring of God. This gospel assumes at all points the truth of the Israelite revelation. Okay. I mean, this is Israel's God who has done this. And so all 39 scrolls of the Hebrew Bible are holy writ to us as well. This gospel is a piece of writing that makes no sense apart from the chosenness of Israel the people of God's election, way back there with Abraham and Sarah. But something has already gone wrong with the plan. John writes, his own received him not. This is to be a story, certainly not of John the Baptist, not of Jesus Christ only, but also a new race of humanity. Just as Genesis starts out in the beginning to tell the origins of the cosmos and the human race, this Gospel of John will be a story about fresh beginnings and a new human race. The light that would shine in darkness in the person of Jesus is the light to which the baptizing prophet John came to bear witness. The entire Gospel will be a disclosure of God by the one in the bosom of the Father who could say, I know him. The fourth evangelist nowhere attempts to prove the marvelous allegation that underlies this gospel, namely that Jesus is sent from God, with whom he has always enjoyed unspeakable intimacy, as Genesis just begins, not by trying to prove, as the Greeks did, this elaborate reasoning of finally coming to an unmoved mover and an uncaused cause, just boom, in the beginning, God. That's the way John begins, in the beginning, the word. This is already the faith of the Johannine. Okay, we haven't used that word for a while. We will hear this. Now, this word has come over strongly into English. It's a German word. Okay. But there were so many great German scholars at the time biblical criticism began. That is, a willingness to take a look at the Bible and see why are these four accounts different? Why are there two creation stories in Genesis? One in chapter 1 and a very different creation story in chapter 2 and so on. The Germans had much to do with that first uh, studying, going back now two and three hundred years. And so some of their words have stayed in our vocabulary, our theological vocabulary. Hence, we talk about that scroll of teaching material that Matthew and Luke had as the quella. That's a German word. We sometimes shorten it to Q. So this is simply a German word for John, Johann. And so if you add the little suffix on the end of it, Johannine is the way it's pronounced. Johannine, it simply means of John, of the community of John usually. So when we say the Johannine, ah, oh, thanks, Diane. Uh, when we say Yohanin, we simply mean the community of John. And I may remind you from time to time, because you, you probably haven't heard that so much. So this is already the faith of the Yohanin community. John merely enunciates it very well. He is in a condition of seeing and knowing through witnesses who give their testimony and have done so going all the way back to the historical Jesus, even though he's probably 60 or 70 years after that. He's a disciple of the original John. The chain of testimony is what matters. It is unbroken. From eyewitnesses have come these insights. 
Okay, let's read on. Verse 19. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. Now notice here, this is one of those places where Dr. C.K. Barrett and others think John does know about the Synoptic Gospels. Because the questions asked here are the very same ones answered in the Synoptic Gospels when Jesus said, Who do the people think I am? And here, are you Elijah? Up at Caesarea Philippi, the disciples said, well, some think you're Elijah, some think you're a great prophet, and so on. So here in John's Gospel, he seems to know about those incidents in Jesus' life. So he has others ask these questions of John the baptizer, and to each one he answers no. Are you Elijah? I'm not. Are you a prophet? No. And who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us out here to ask you. Remember, he's down at the Jordan River. And the Jordan River is... 17 miles, was then, is now, 17 miles, winding road up to Jerusalem, winding road down to the river. In 17 miles, you ascend or descend almost a mile. So if you have to walk from the river up to Jerusalem, it's a pretty pretty good walk, 17 miles and gaining a mile in elevation. So they send people down there. Go ask John. Who do you think you are? So we've got to go back and tell those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And this is what he said. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And what is he doing? He's quoting scripture. He's going back to the book of Isaiah. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. And here he's quoting directly from the Septuagint. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So there's one Bethany that's right there, just three miles from Jerusalem. But there's another one down on the Jordan River, was at that time. Okay, notice here, uh, John says, standing among you is this person. You remember what one of the Synoptic Gospels says? It says John the Baptist and Jesus were first cousins. Remember? John's question that we have in the Synoptics is not, are you Jesus? Just, are you the one we've been waiting for? So there's some indication John knew Jesus, Jesus knew John. Uh, even for John, he keeps, uh, when he's really facing death and he's about to lose his head, he sends word, are, are you the one we were waiting for, Jesus? You know, are you? But here he says, he's standing among you. You don't know him yet. He's standing among you. Verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. Okay. So indication he knows him. And declared, here is the Lamb of God. Now, early on, you see, John begins to equate Jesus with that Passover Lamb. He is the Lamb of God. And we sing this when we celebrate the sacrament here. It's called in Latin, the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, that taketh away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. We sing it just before you come to the table. O Lamb of God, that taketh away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that taketh away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. And down through the centuries, when great composers have set the Mass to music, they always have an Agnus Dei, their arrangement of O Lamb of God. It's very important in John's Gospel. Here he already uses it. Verse 30. John is still speaking. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. And here he's alluding to John's in the beginning was the word. Uh, John is supposedly older than Jesus. Remember, he is born first to Elizabeth, then Jesus born. So he doesn't mean age wise. He means Jesus 
having always been in the heart and mind and being of God, was long before me, even though physically was born after him. Okay. This is who Homa said. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit. Now in Hebrew it's Ruach. In Greek it's Numa. Descending from heaven like a dove. And it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, here he calls him the same thing, Look, here is the Lamb of God, the Anus Dei. The two disciples heard him say this, And they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi. And notice here's one of John's little footnotes. He's afraid these Jews who now are Greek speaking may not know all the words. Or if they know, then someone in his readership will not know. And so he tells you, which translated means teacher. That was not added by your translators. That's in the oldest manuscript we have. They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Now one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed or in Greek Christos. Now notice how this is different. Where did these brothers, Andrew and Peter, meet Jesus in the synoptics? While they were fishing up on the Sea of Galilee. Here they're down at the river where John is baptizing. So see, there's a little difference here. He brought Simon to Jesus. How many sermons have you heard on that when you were growing up? Somebody who brings his brother to Jesus. I've heard that one uh, many times. He brought Simon to Jesus who looked at him and said, Now, he isn't called the rock in the synoptics until he says, I believe you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. But here in John, it comes very early, way down here at the river. You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which in Greek is Petros or the rock. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. So he's been down at the Jordan with with uh, these brothers, and he's been baptized as they had been. The Holy Spirit has descended on him. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the Torah and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, it's such a little nowhere place, it's not mentioned in any of the 39 scrolls of the Hebrew Bible. It was a real place, but it was a little nowhere unimportant. Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, he is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He's a good man. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. Notice in this calling of Andrew and Peter, Nathanael and Philip, no James and John. No James and John is in the uh, in the synoptics. Okay, uh, I'm going to put a mark, we've got to stop here, that we've read this passage and then we'll get a few remarks from Dr. Sloyan before we move on to chapter 2, okay? All right, don't rush off. I'll be right back.